This is a lecture by L. Ron Hubbard given on the 19th of July, 1954. The title of this lecture is Scientology, Its General Background, Part 1. This lecture is 31 minutes long. Reproduced by Golden Era Productions. giving you a lecture now on Scientology, its general background, as it might be known to man. Scientology is, of course, a word which you might say is anglicized. We know what science means. We know that science means truth or wisdom, and we know what ology means. Anybody knows that? That means study. But this does not mean the study of science. This means the study of wisdom, which is about as close as you can get as a straight definition, unless you said wisdomology, or unless you said Scientology is wisdom. Uh, and you said that what you were practicing was wisdom. If you said this clearly, that, that would make a, a, uh, a more definite point than saying you were practicing Scientology. But in the essence of the word, it is not talking about science. It's just that the Western world recognizes in the word science something close to a truth. Now, we have the derivation of Scientology being skio, which means knowingness in the fullest sense of the word. And that is the reason why this Scientology was put together. It's the most emphatic word that existed in Western languages, Romance languages, which includes, of course, Latin, uh, one of the roots of English. And uh, it's a very emphatic statement of no. It's knowingness in the fullest sense of the word. It's not otherwise qualified. Now, you notice it isn't science-tology. It might have been better stated as skeotology. But again, that is not close enough to English. So we use a word which is fairly easy to say, which is simply Scientology. You notice here that for a long while we have not used the word Dianetics. Not because Dianetics does not belong to the HAS. It does. Uh, 100%. It is a mental therapy and says so in its own title. It says Dianetics. The derivation of that word was dia, noose, with an uh, English engineering twist on it, etics, which meant no more and no less than through mind. Well, in view of the fact that the Western world thinks of mind as something that mental uh, cases have and other things, we weren't particularly interested in continuing to concentrate upon this thing called mind, although mind is a perfectly useful word. But look at this, through mind. In Scientology, we're not going through mind. We're talking about knowledge. So Dianetics was a mental therapy. There is no doubt about that. And there is no doubt about it that it is a very legitimate ancestor of Scientology. But Scientology is a thing of considerable amplitude, where Dianetics was a very narrow thing indeed. And Dianetics belonged in the world of psychology. And Scientology does not belong in the world of psychology and is not an advanced psychology and cannot be defined in the framework of psychology. Psychology is an anglicized word, not necessarily its root words, because today we find that psychology is composited from psyche and ology, and psyche is mind or soul, but leading psychological texts begin very, very carefully 
by saying that today the word does not refer to the mind or to the soul. To quote one, it has to be studied by its own history since uh, it no longer refers to the soul nor even to the mind. So we don't know what psychology refers to. It simply got lost. And so we have to step out and take a word which actually means what it means, which is a study of knowingness, a study of wisdom. We have to take that word because that is what we are doing. Now, philosophically, there is a word called epistemology. But epistemology is quite separate from ontology, another word in the same category as epistemology. Matter is considered to be separate in philosophy. Matter is considered one direction, uh, thought in another direction, and so on. In other words, we are already looking at a cloudy vocabulary when we look at the field of Western philosophy. In fact, nowhere in the West can we find any qualifications for a study which assumes to reach the highest possible level of knowledge which can be attained by man or life. We find nowhere in the Western world a word or a tradition which will embrace Scientology, which makes a difficulty for an auditor when he is trying to communicate to people in the society around him. Since they want to know what Scientology is, and then he speaks to them without this tradition, they assume that the word psychology embraces all sorts of eccentricities found in mental behavior. They assume this. So they could not possibly understand how anything could be said to exceed or not be the same as psychology. And they are left in the dilemma of non-recognition. You have not communicated when you have said, we study wisdom. You see, if you just said that, they would say, oh yes, that's very well, I did that in the third grade. Now, in view of the fact that you go out of communication in a society which has no standard of communication on the subject about which you were talking, it is therefore necessary to resort to various shifts in trying to describe what you were doing. You have to find the background which actually leads to an understanding of your subject. Now, there are many ways that this could be accomplished. But before we worry about that too much, let's take up something that is quite important to us and is not limited by any ignorance that we discover in Western civilization. Let us take up probably 10,000 years of study on the part of man of the identity of God or gods, uh, the possibility of truth, the inner track mystery of all mysteries, in other words, the mystery of life itself. And we find that for 10,000 years, which figure, by the way, does not agree today with uh, certain historians, but then they don't know much of the data I am talking to you about. Uh, but for about 10,000 years that we know of, man has been on this track we find that the material which is extant even in Western civilization and in Asia has gathered to itself an enormous verbiage, you might say. There's somewhere between, and I think it would be adventurous to state an exact number, but there's somewhere between 125,000 and 150,000 books which have been written and which comprise the 
Veda and Buddhist libraries. Now, that's a lot of books. Of course, some of them are very, very short. But here's a tremendous amount of data. Now, if all this data is in existence, then why doesn't the Western world know more about this data? We have to go back and take a little look at what happened about 10,000 years ago. Of course, that's rather cloudy, too. You could probably straight wire it. But uh, uh, let's put it into the field of anthropology, rather into the field of uh, study or history. And we discover that perhaps much earlier than 10,000 years ago, there was a division of peoples here on Earth. The division point was evidently the Ural Mountains. I am talking to you now from material given to me by the professor of ethnology at Princeton University where I studied. And I have no more data than he gave me and have no further qualification than this, except the man was an expert in his own field. And what he said seemed quite reasonable to me, and so I am saying it to you. There was evidently a split of races somewhere in the vicinity of the Ural Mountains. Evidently, part of the population, which is now in the Northern Hemisphere, went east, and part of it went west. The boarding spot of the human race uh, has been variously disputed. But uh, if we don't worry about the boarding spot, we just say that is more or less what occurred at that time, that there was a sharp division and that part of the Northern Hemisphere's peoples uh, went east and part of them went west. We discover that a singular difference of personality occurred, which is, in the Northern Hemisphere, the most observable difference. The people who went into the steppes, into the Gobi, into China, India, and into the various islands, were evidently faced by an enormous chain of deserts. They were faced by privations of great magnitude, and they developed a philosophy of enduring. That was the keynote, because that was what their environment demanded of them. They had to endure. And so we find these races colored in a certain way so as to thwart the onslaught of sun and snow. We find them uh, without protection uh, naturally in their environment, and uh, therefore we find them able to survive long after those who went in the opposite direction. This is a peculiarity. A Chinese, for instance, uh, float on a raft off the Cape of, well, it was Cape Horn uh, during the war, had been on the raft for 80 days without food and water and was picked up off the raft and wondered why they bundled him in blankets. And as soon as he could manage it, uh, he had been on a British vessel which had been torpedoed. As soon as he could manage it, he threw off the blankets and went up and reported to the cook shack and went to work. He had been a cook on a vessel which had been torpedoed. Eighty days without food and water, a wash on a raft in the South Pacific. In other words, he had learned how to endure. And so it is. Their colorations, their customs, and so on, are different from ours just to the degree that they can survive in tremendously arduous surroundings. And the surroundings of those lands is arduous. It is a very arduous land indeed. Those races that are there are able to endure and if you said anything about them, this is certainly a, a clear statement. They also are tremendously practical. Their practicality is such as to stagger a white man. The explanations uh, that they will suddenly and innocently uh, voice to a query uh, are always of such sweeping simplicity that uh, they leave a white man standing there staring with a slack jaw.
Now, the races which went in the opposite direction from the Urals evidently went into a country uh, which had a heavy forestation. It had uh, a great deal of game. And the philosophy of the Western world became that of striking a hard blow. If you could strike a blow of great magnitude, hard enough and fast enough, you could kill game and so you could live. Because of the vegetation and because of many other factors, they did not particularly need coloration. They, their own customs did not need to be as thoroughly practical. And they were able to dispose of their lives much more uh, easily, you might say, since food was plentiful, as it was not in Asia. And we discover the Western philosophy building up on the behavior pattern of striking a hard blow. Get in there quick, hit hard, your game drops, and you eat. And beyond that, not very much thought or practicality. Now, however the truth of this may be, uh, here certainly is something which is said to have preceded a period of 10,000 years ago. It might or might not have truth. We care nothing about that, but it is a very fast explanation of this. And we discover immediately, as we look at these two worlds, that one of these worlds having to endure, being faced with enormous privation, would, of course, develop a certain patience and an ability to philosophize, an ability to think. It would take a long time uh, for anyone to think all the way through something. And a man who is merely accustomed to striking a hard blow is not likely to think all the way through something. When we are up against philosophy, we are fortunately or unfortunately up against an Asian tradition. This is a tradition which is not necessarily that of colored peoples or strangers. This, by the way, would come as a great shock to people in the Western world to discover that in India the ruling caste is quite as white as any Norseman. This would be of great interest to them. Uh, and is something which comes as rather a shock to an individual throughout that area. Because they have a tradition of enduring, they have preserved records. Therefore, we do not know what went on in North America. We can only guess. We do not know what went on in South America. There are a few ruins kicking around, but uh, beyond this, we don't know very much. We uh, get down into uh, the Mediterranean basin, and we discover that there was a certain traffic with Asia, and therefore there is quite a bit known about the Mediterranean Basin. This uh, philosophy of endurance and so forth came through into the Middle East very poorly, but it was to be found there. The records of Europe we can hold in tremendous question. They do not know where or when they had ice ages. They actually cannot trace from one millennia to the next who was where and owned what. Every now and then they have to write a history, so everybody sits down, gets in a good state of agreement, and writes a history. To such an extent that Voltaire uh, dubbed history a Mississippi of lies. Now, where the Western world is concerned, we have records which go back, probably written records, we say, on Earth, 3,500 years. Well, this may or may not be true. But certainly, the schools in the Western world teach us that we can go back that far with written records. And they go back to Issus, I've forgotten what particular Egyptian dynasty. And they have found records in that particular area. And they hold these up as being very old. Uh, but be very careful, be very, very careful that you do not leave the Western world if you are looking for early records. Be very careful about that.
Uh, in order to have a blackout of history and a blackout of knowledge, you have to stay on this side of the Ural Mountains. You go across them, and you discover no such blackout. You discover a tradition of wisdom which reaches back about 10,000 years. And that is the oldest trace that we have. Now, true enough, we don't necessarily have to recognize that there are written works any older than any anthropologist in the Western world knows about. It does happen, however, that there is a set of hymns which I would, I would love to give you the favorite Western figure, which puts them after Egyptian. But it doesn't happen to be the case. As far as I can remember, it was about 8212 B.C. when these things were introduced into the societies of Earth. They are hymns, and it would seem that if we spoke of hymns, then these, these would contain then mostly modes or rites of worship, since they were religious. But that would only be our Western interpretation of what is religious. These were religious hymns. But they are our earliest debt in Scientology, our earliest debt, because the very early hymns contain much that we know today checks against what we have rediscovered or what we have followed back to. And this material includes such a common thing as the cycle of action of the Mest universe known to you in Scientology as the cycle of action. And this is contained in, I think, the hymn to the dawn child, variously captioned and, and uh, translated by uh, Western translators. But uh, always this information is there. Furthermore, we find in that same set of hymns the theory of evolution brought forward a hundred years ago, or slightly less, by Charles Darwin. In fact, as we look at these hymns, we discover almost any information you want to discover later, whether you call it science or Christian science. Here's a tremendous body of knowledge. They are supposed to have come forward in spoken tradition, memorized from generation to generation, and finally to have been set down. Now, this is a Western interpretation of what happened to them. I would not hear to say whether this is true or false, but I can tell you that today these hymns are still in existence, but they are very hard to acquire in the Western world. They have, you have to find the specialized translations of them. And they are studied as curiosa more than anything else. But we do not know what sciences would suddenly open their doors should someone sit down and begin to study the Veda. We don't know what would happen. But it's a very strange thing that uh, information seems to have leaked from that direction into the Middle East and into Europe rather constantly over the thousands of years. Man is fond of believing that yesterday's man was unable to walk, to travel, to move. We find, however, uh, in our Western libraries a book called The Travels of Marco Polo. And everyone is quite surprised that a white man was serving Kublai Khan in that age. Well, that was an unthinkably early age. But we discover that uh, Tamerlane had in his court an Arabian known as Ibn Battuta who had uh, just completed uh, a series of books about his journeyings and travels throughout Europe and Africa and Asia. We don't discover that man had any great difficulty in getting around. That's the truth of the matter. He did not have a great deal of difficulty in getting around. He had as late as 1200, certainly, he had horses, and horses can go almost any place. Uh, he was able to make his way here and there across the surface of Earth. 
And naturally, where you get this, you get a transplantation of information. For instance, today, anyone who knows China discovers nothing very strange in Italian cookery. And he would not discover it very strange that Italian cookery suddenly came into being and took place shortly after the return of Marco Polo and many other travelers who had been in the same area. Just because one wrote about it is no reason a lot of people weren't there. It is always a matter of astonishment to some member of the Explorers Club to pick up all the information he needs about an area which is new, wild, and completely unexplored from the white man or the Chinese, particularly the Chinese, who has been living there for the last 40 years. And yet, the explorer brings back the information and publishes it in journals and makes it available to people. The information collected by that white man on the ground was probably merely told to his family when he got home, and it was not broadly broadcast. So we have to recognize that certain information is broadcast broadly, and some is merely carried around. And so there'd be two categories of spreading information around. Marco Polo and Ibn Battuta happened to be writers, and like writers, they wrote but that is no reason why they were the only people in motion during the last 3,500 years. So it is no wonder that we discover the various wisdoms of Egypt appearing as the earliest wisdoms of Greece. It is no wonder why we look into the Christian uh, Bibles and find ourselves reading the Egyptian Book of the Dead. It's no wonder that we look into the middle of the Romantic period of Europe and find that the Arabian Nights had just been translated and discover that European literature did a complete revolution at that point. Now, uh, I'm not stressing the fact that nothing has ever been thought up in Europe. Yes, yes, lots of things have been thought up in Europe. But Europe has made tremendous strides forward immediately that its doors were opened to Eastern information. Because the Eastern tradition is you can sit and think. And sometimes somebody in the Western world is reminded of this. And when he's reminded of it, he is struck by the fact that he can sit down and think too. And if we have been taught anything, it is the patience of the East which permitted itself to stop acting long enough to find out how and why. And it's that tradition alone to which we are most indebted to Asia. But are we indebted to Asia? Is it to Asia at all? Or is it merely to man on this planet who, breaking into two halves, you might say, went east and went west, the common ancestors of man. All of us have the same potentials, but it happens that the information which has been collected over the years is available in Asia. It has not been preserved in the Western world. Therefore, we look to such things as the Veda. We look to such things as the Buddhist texts, to the Tao Te King and other materials of this character from Asia to carry forward to us information of the past. Who knows but what these materials did not come out of Europe in the first place and go over to Asia. We could uh, follow a very dubious track in all directions, but we do know as we sit here in the Western world that man has a tradition of wisdom which goes back about 10,000 years, which is very positively traceable and we find Scientology's earliest certainly known ancestor in the Veda. The Veda is a very, very interesting work, as I just told you. It is a study of the wherein's and whereas's and who made it and why. It is a religion. It should not be confused as anything else but a religion. And the very word Veda simply means lookingness or knowingness. That is all it means. That is all it has ever meant, lookingness, knowingness. And so we can look back across a certain span of time, across a great many minds, and into a great many 
places where man has been able to sit still long enough to think through this oldest record and find where it joins up with the present and to what we in Scientology are rightly indebted for to say that out of whole cloth and with no background that a Westerner such as myself should suddenly develop all you need to know to do the thing they were trying to do is an incredible and an unbelievable and an untrue statement. Had the information of the Veda not been available to me, if I had not had a very sharp cognizance of earlier information on this whole track, and if at the same time I had never been trained in an American university, which gave me a background of science, there could not have been enough understanding of the Western world to apply anything Eastern to. And we would have simply had the Eastern world again. But the Western world has to hit with a punch. It has to produce an effect. It has to get there. Nobody urged Asia to get there. You could sit on a mountaintop for a thousand years and it was perfectly all right with everybody in the whole neighborhood. They'd pick you up for vagrancy in the West. <laughs> so we combined the collective wisdom of all those ages with a sufficient impatience and urgency, a sufficiency of scientific methodology, and I think, by the way, that Gautama Sakyamuni probably had a better command of scientific methodology than any of your chairs of science. Uh, in Western universities. We, we have to depend, though, upon this scientific methodology and mathematics and so forth to catalyze and bring to a head the ambition of 10,000 years of thinking men. And if I have added anything to this at all, it has simply been the urgency necessary to arrive, which was fairly well lacking in the Eastern world. We'll continue with this in a moment. This is a lecture by L. Ron Hubbard given on the 19th of July, 1954. The title of this lecture is Scientology, Its General Background, Part 2. This lecture is 32 minutes long. Reproduced by Golden Era Productions. Continuing with this lecture, we have then the earliest known material uh, being the Veda, uh, very, very little actually has arrived in the Western world of any of this work, either uh, Vedantic, Bodhistic, any of these works. Very, very little of them have been translated. There's, as I said, between 125,000 and 150,000 sacred books that would take somebody a long time to get through, so the Lord knows exactly what is in these books. But the Veda itself means simply knowingness or sacred lore, and don't think that that is otherwise than a synonym. Knowingness has always been considered sacred lore. It has never been otherwise than sacred lore. And it's only been in the Western world 
which is just growing up just now, where you had sacred lore uh, hanging on so long as a superstition. But we will get into that in just a moment. Now, the Veda, should you care to look it over, is best read, of course, in a literal translation from Sanskrit. And there are uh, four major divisions of the Veda. They're uh, all of them quite worthwhile, as much as you could pick up of them. And as I say, uh, a great deal of our material in Scientology is discovered right back there. So this makes the earliest part of Scientology sacred lore. All right. Now, the next written work, which is supposed to be the oldest written work, according to various friends of mine, is a book called The Book of Job. It is an Indian book, and it is quite ancient. Uh, it probably predates uh, quite a bit that is called early Egyptian. And we discover that this book of Job uh, contained in it uh, simply the laborings and sufferings and necessity for patience of one man faced with a somewhat capricious God. Now, other such works, uh, like the book of Job, are scattered on along the time track and are known to us here in the Western world as sacred works. They are thought to have come to us from the Middle East, but that would be a very short look. That is something like your, your pre-clear who can only see uh, with certainty a spot in the room, but not a spot out in the street. It would just be the distance tolerable. Actually, we're looking at the Middle East as a relay point. And as we think of wisdom, we have to think for the Western world of the Middle East as a relay point. A relay point, by the way, uh, from India and from Africa into Europe. And as you see, it follows a trade route in both directions. And so you have the roadways of the world, you might say, crossing through the Middle East. So we would expect such things as the book of Job to turn up in the Middle East as holy. You would expect such things as uh, the book of the dead of the Egyptians to turn up in the Middle East as part of the New Testament and so on. There could be a great deal of argument about this. Someone who is passionately devoted to practice rather than wisdom, there are two different things here in, that embrace religion, uh, would argue with you, but you're not interested in arguing on that line because we can make this very, very clear differentiation right here and now. The word religion itself can embrace sacred lore, wisdom, knowingness of gods and souls and spirits, which could be called, with a very loose use of the word, a philosophy. So we could say there is religious philosophy and there is religious practice. Now, religious practice could take the identical source and by interpretation put it into effect and so create various churches all dependent upon the identical source, such as St. Luke. If we think of the number of Christian churches there are, and we look at this one book, St. Luke, and realize that just this one book, St. Luke, was productive of Baptists, Methodists, Episcopalians, Catholics, and here we go. We have this tremendous number of practices basing upon one wisdom. So let's, let's get a very clear differentiation here when we talk about religious philosophy and religious practice. And someone who comes to you and says so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so uh, is actually uh, the way you're supposed to worship God, you can very cleanly and very clearly and very suddenly bring him to a halt by merely mentioning to him that he is talking about religious practice and you are talking about religious philosophy. Even a Catholic priest hauls up so that you can smell his brakes on that one. <laughs>
Now, just coming down the track in a little more orderly fashion, we get now to the Dao Te King, which uh, is known to us uh, in the Western world as Taoism in China. And we may have heard of this religious practice in China. Well, Taoism, as currently practiced today, may or may not ever have heard of the Tao Te King. See, it, it may, may or may not ever have connected. But we are certainly talking about religious philosophy when we mention the Tao Te King. Now, it was uh, written by Lao Tzu uh, in approximately, oh, I, I'd say probably about 530 or 529 B.C., something around that period. Uh, he wrote it just before he disappeared forever. And uh, his uh, birth and death dates are traditionalized as 604 uh, born to 531 died B.C., both cases. Now, this is the next important milestone in the roadway of knowledge itself. Uh, we have there the Tao. Now, what was the Tao? It meant the way to solving the mystery which underlies all mysteries. This was the way to resolve the mystery of mysteries. It wasn't simply the way. Now, the Western world thinks of it as the way, and they don't know quite whether we're talking about the way of life or something like that, but I would suppose this would only be the case if they were unfamiliar with the book itself. It is a book, and it was written by this man when ordered to do so by the gatekeeper before uh, the gatekeeper would let him leave the city. Uh, Lao Tzu was a very obscure fellow, very little known about him. His main passion was obscurity, and uh, he started to leave town one day, and the gatekeeper turned him around and told him he could not leave town until he went home and he wrote this book. Well, this book's a very short book. It's about, uh, I don't know how many characters. I've seen it in Chinese. It must not be more than maybe 5,000, 6,000 characters. A very short book, and uh, he merely uh, wrote down uh, his philosophy on this and gave it to the gatekeeper and disappeared. He went out the gate. That was the last we ever hear of Lao Tzu. Uh, the pronunciations I'm giving you, by the way, are the pronunciations which I heard around me as a boy. They are not necessarily the proper uh, Western pronunciation, since we have agreed to mispronounce, and uh, so has everyone agreed to mispronounce on 10,000 years of track. Well, when we have uh, this book, we begin to see that somebody is trying to go somewhere without going on something. Uh, we have the Western world defining this as teaching conformity with a cosmic order and teaching simplicity in social and political organization. Well, this, in essence, was what it laid down, and this would be a very finite goal for it, but this was actually not the Tao. The Tao uh, simply said, uh, you can solve the mystery that lies behind all mysteries, and this more or less would be the way uh, you might go about it, but of course, what you're trying to solve itself does not possess the mechanics which you believe to be inherent to the other kinds of problems which you solve. Uh, it says that uh, uh, a man could seek his Taohood in various uh, ways, but he would have to practice and live in a certain way in order to achieve Taohood. Now, there's no reason to belabor this any further, but it would amaze you that this book is a very civilized piece of work. It would be the kind of civilized work which you would... Uh, expect maybe to appear from a very, very uh, educated, extremely uh, compassionate, pleasant people of a higher intellectual order than we're accustomed to read. It is a very fine book. It's sort of simple, it's sort of naive, and it tells you that you should be simple and economical and uh, should do this and that. and. That is, by the way, about the only flaw there is in it from a Scientological point of view, that you must be economical. <laughs> that, that, one, that one is a little off the groove. Uh, 
But the rest of the way, who knows but what if we took uh, the Tao just as written, and uh, knowing what we know already about Scientology, we simply set out to practice the Tao. I don't know but what we wouldn't get a theta clear. I'm not sure about this, but it actually is merely a set of directions on how you would go down this way which itself has no path and no distance. In other words, it teaches you that you had better get out of space and get away from objects in order to get any consciousness of the beingness as things are, and it tells you that if you could do this, then you'd know the whole answer and you'd be all set. And what do we do in Scientology? Now, Tao means knowingness. <laughs> that is the literal translation of the word, if you want to translate it that way. In other words, it's, a, it's an ancestor to the word Scientology, just as such. Uh, Scientology is also a study of how to know. It's the science of knowing how to know. The Tao is the way to knowing how to know, but it isn't said that way. It's inverted. It's said, it is the way to achieve the mystery which lies back of all mysteries. Now, however crude this might seem to somebody who was specialized in the Tao, that's really all we need to know about it, except this one thing. Uh, there is a principle known as Wu Wei. Now, it could be called Wu Wei, but I've heard it mostly Wu Wei, which is odd because it goes right in with the Tao, which also means the way. All right, it's W-U uh, hyphen W-E-I. Now, uh, as you were probably... Uh, vaguely familiar with a practice known as judo or jujitsu. Uh, this is a principle which crudely applies to action more or less in that fashion. But let's, let's take a look at this and let's find out that it's non-assertion or non-compulsion. And that is right there in the Tao, self-determinism. You let them use their self-determinism. A little later on with judo, they found out that if you let a man be self-determined enough, you could lick him every time. <laughs> well, uh, that was outside the scope, actually, of the Tao. But that's an interesting fact to find sitting there uh, as one of the practices uh, which emanated from the Tao. That's the Tao Te King. That's T-A-O, T-E-H-K-I-N-G. You would call it probably normally Tao Te King. I don't know why they spell it with a T. I've never heard it called anything but Tao. Well, it must have been that there were a lot of very, very clever people on earth at that time because we find in the lifetime of Lao Tzu one called Confucius, of whom you have heard so much. But unfortunately, Confucius evidently never wrote a single word. Confucius is reported by those who were around him, his disciples. And he took most of his material, or gave credit, to some ancient Chinese works. And one of them, if I remember rightly, oh, they have very poetic names. What are they? One of them, I think, is the Book of the Winds. Uh, and these are very, very ancient. And I have seen some fragmentary translations of them. Well, of course, Confucius himself was the great apostle of conservatism and as such has ever since been the very, very model philosopher to have in a government. He is worshipped today by many, many levels in China. You can buy his statue uh, with great ease. With great ease. In fact, you have to beat people off with a club who are trying to sell you statues of Confucius throughout North China. Now, uh, the amount of superstition which has grown up around Confucius is considerable, but we have in, in both Lao Tzu and Confucius two people who never otherwise than pretended to be human beings who were simply pointing out a way of life. Now, Confucius is of no great interest to us. He is not of any great interest to us uh, because Confucius was codifying conduct most of the time. And... Uh, the great philosopher of that day, 
if less known, was Lao Tzu. All right, we come into the main period of the Diana, or Diana. Now, the Diana has as a background almost as legendary a distance as the Veda. It is something which comes up in India uh, in its mythological period. It's legendary in its basics. Dharma was the name of a legendary Hindu sage whose many progenies were the personification of virtue and religious rites. Uh, Dharma, he's a, a mythological figure. And uh, we have the word Dharma almost interchangeable with the word Dhyana. D-H-Y-A-N-A, -A. that's Dharma's D-H-A-R-M-A. -A. But whatever you use there, you're using a word which means knowingness. That's what that word means. Dhyana, that's knowingness. It means knowingness, it means lookingness, and so forth. In other words, we are again pounding down the line, and it is no uh, liberal interpretation of mine, you see, that has called the Veda the Tao, uh, the Dharma, uh, knowingness. I mean, this is what they go in for. And these are all religious works. This is the religion we're talking about. Now we're moving in to the religion of about two-thirds of the population of Earth. It is a tremendous body of people that we're talking about when we start to talk about this. This is the biggest religion on Earth today, and we erroneously know about it and call it Buddhism in the Western world. And it has very little to do with, with Buddhism. I mean, Buddha, as I will tell you in a moment, that, that's something else. What we're talking about there is the dhyana. The dhyana is what the Buddhists talk about. That's their background. All right. We first find this word Buddha actually is Bodhi. And a Bodhi is one who has attained intellectual and ethical perfection by human means. That's a Bodhi. Well, that probably would be a Dianetic release or something of this level. Now, there's another level uh, that... Uh, was mentioned to me, uh, Arhat, with which I'm not particularly familiar, but is said to be more comparable to our idea of Theta Clear. But uh, Bodhi, that's a very interesting word. There were many Bodhis, Buddhas, you might say. And the greatest of these was a fellow by the name of Gautama Sakyamuni. And he lived between 563 and 483 B.C., now, I won't go so far as to say he'd ever read the Tao Te King. I won't go so far as to say that because there's absolutely no evidence to that effect at all, <laughs> except that they certainly were riding on the same pathway. So much so that uh, when the Taoists turned into Buddhism later on, they never abandoned the Tao. And Taoist principles became Chinese Buddhist principles to a very large measure. And what we have just talked about in terms of knowing the way to knowingness is very, very closely associated here with Buddha. Uh, we call him Buddha. Uh, it would be Lord Buddha or Gautama Buddha or the Blessed One or the Enlightened One or almost anything. <laughs> but uh, he is looked upon, and uh, this, according to my uh, belief in the line, er erroneously, actually, as the founder of the Diana. Uh, I think that this was in existence for quite a long time before he came along, but he pumped life into it. He gave it codification. He straightened it up, 
and made it run on the right track. And it's kept running in that direction ever since. He did such a thoroughly good job. He was such a, an excellent scientific philosopher, and he himself was so persuasive and so penetrative in his work that nobody has ever managed to pry apart Diana and Gautama Buddha. Uh, this is a, an identification which is a very close one, and in areas that have no understanding whatsoever of the principles laid down by Gautama Buddha, we find him sitting there as an idol, which would have been a very, very amusing thing to Buddha, because he never said that he was otherwise than a human being. He never pretended to be anything other than a human being, like Lao Tzu. Now, he... Uh, didn't ever have any revelations from supernatural sources. There were no guardian angels sitting on his shoulders preaching to him, and uh, so on, as in the case of Muhammad and some other prophets. Uh, nobody was ever giving him the word, but he went around giving people the word, believe me. <laughs> he walked from 15 to 20 miles a day, and you could always find him in a new place talking to some new people. And uh, he was uh, very, very compassionate, as a matter of fact, the stories which are told about him uh, with his, his compassion for life itself and his ability, you might say, to grant beingness. These are very great. Also, other stories. They tried, by the way, once upon a time to discredit him by uh, raping and murdering a woman in a grove near which he was speaking and tried to discredit him. But later on, the ruffians who did it got drunk in a tavern and were apprehended and appropriately disposed of. To some other various things occurred which are not very far out of line. Uh, he taught a chap who then set up a uh, school of his own and who became violently incensed because Buddha continued to be successful and he himself was not successful. So he uh, uh, had a, a large stone rolled down from a mountain while Buddha was walking on the road and the stone accidentally split in half and the two halves of it passed on either side of Buddha and uh, didn't hit him. And I th there was another incident about a roaring elephant who was mad, who was turned loose on Buddha, and uh, he took one look at Buddha and calmed down. <laughs> These, however, don't, to us at least, border on the supernatural. I mean, a man could conceivably do something of this character. Uh, if he had any ability to grant beingness whatsoever, stopping an elephant in his tracks isn't very difficult. He never intended to be anything but a human being, and he was a teacher. Tremendously interesting man. Now, uh, we find, however, some of the things uh, that were written by Gautama very significantly interesting to us, very, very interesting to us, completely aside from Diana could be literally translated as Indian for Scientology, if you want to say it backwards. Uh, and that is simply this. This was in the Dharmapada. All that we are is the result of what we have thought. It is founded upon our thoughts, it is made up of our thoughts. Interesting, isn't it? Uh, the next verse, you might say, is by oneself evil is done. By oneself one suffers. By oneself evil is left undone. By oneself one is purified. Purity and impurity belong to oneself. No one can purify another. Well, it's just as you say, you can't grant beingness to the pre-clear and overall him. You've got to have him working on self-determinism or not at all if you wanted to give that any kind of an interpretation. In other words, you've got to restore his ability to grant beingness or he does not become well, and we know that by test. And we go here into the next verse. You yourself must make an effort. The Buddhas are only preachers. The thoughtful who enter the way are freed from the bondage of sin. The thoughtful. Now the next one, he who does not rouse himself when it is time to rise, he, though young and strong, is full of sloth, whose will and thoughts are weak, that lazy and idle man will never find the way to enlightenment. The common denominator of psychosis and neurosis is the inability to work. And the next verse, 
Strenuousness is the path of immortality. Sloth, the path of death. Those who are strenuous do not die. Those that are slothful are as if dead already. Now, this is some of the material from that. By the way, a little bit later on uh, in his work, uh, in a discourse with one Ananda, uh, we discover him announcing the fact that you have to abstain from the uh, six pairs of things, in other words, 12 separate things, and we in Scientology would recognize them as the various parts of things, such as space, making and breaking communication, and so forth. They're all just named, one right after the other there, but he said you had to abstain from them. And the main difficulty is, of course, the interpretation of exactly what he said. What did he say? What was written? Because the truth of the matter is that abstaining from these things would mean that you had to get into a position where you could tolerate them before you could abstain them. And that is the main breaking point of all such teachings, is one did not recognize that one simply didn't negate against everything and then become pure. And the way it's been interpreted is, if you run away from all living, then you can live forever. That's the way it's been interpreted. But understand, that was never the way it was said. All right, the religion of Buddhism, carried by its teachers, brought civilization into the existing barbarisms as of that time of India, China, Japan, and the Near East, or about two-thirds of the Earth's population. This was the first civilization they had had. For instance, Japan, written language, uh, her ability to make lacquer, uh, silk, uh, almost any technology which she has today was taught to her by Buddhist monks who emigrated over to Japan from China. The first broadcast of wisdom resulted in very, very high cultures. The cultures which ensued from Buddhism were very easily recognizable from those superstitions which had existed heretofore. No light thing occurred there. It was just some people who had the idea that there was wisdom. And having that wisdom, you went out and told it to people. And you told them that there was a way that you could find a salvation. And that way was by becoming your own mind essence. And if you lived a fairly pure life, lacking in sensuousness and evil practices, in other words, overt acts, why, probably you could exteriorize and break, which they knew very well in those days, the endless chain of birth and death. You could break that endless chain. Now, all this material, all this material up to this point, was given to a world which was evidently clearly cognizant of the manifestation of exteriorization and was cognizant that one was living consecutive lives. 2,500 years later, you would expect a race to be plowed in far enough below that so they would no longer be conscious of consecutive lives but only single ones. And the hope of Buddhism was to reach salvation in one lifetime. That was the hope of Buddhism. That hope, by various practices, was now and then, here and there, attained. But no set of precise practices ever came forward, which immediately, predictably, produced a result. You understand that many of the practices would occasionally produce a result. But it was a religion which, to that degree, had to go forward on hope, a hope which has extended forward over a great, great many years. Now, the material which was released at that time is cluttered with a great many irrelevancies. A great deal of it is buried. You have to be very selective, and you have to know Scientology, actually, to plow it out and get it into the clear, but much less than you would believe. It was wisdom 
it was really wisdom and is today the background of the religious practices because you don't think for a moment that a Buddhist in the western hills of China knows the uh, uh, various words of Gautama Sakyamuni. He, he doesn't. He has certain practices which he practices. The basic wisdom is thin. And with that as a background, however, they have certain religious rites, and they follow these religious rites. So even, even in China, very close to India, where this came forward, and it was sent directly into China from India, we have uh, the immediate division from the wisdom into the practice. And we have almost all of China, in one fashion or another, bowing down to uh, some form of Buddhism and a very little of the intellectual world knowing actually the real background of Buddhism. But we have there a civilization where before Buddhism we didn't have one, which is quite important to us. Now, there so far is your track of wisdom, which merely brings us up to the beginning of 2,000 years ago, which we will have to take up subsequently.